Right. So last section we're going to look at this week is 6.5. Um, we'll, we'll do as much of 6.5 as we can today. Uh, we're not going to finish. We'll finish whatever we don't get to tomorrow. So this section is going to be about trig functions, kind of like we did with unit circle. But we're going to look at the definitions of trig functions using three words that are called opposite, adjacent, and hypotenuse. Those are words that have to do with a right triangle. So we're not going to be focusing on finding a coordinate like unit circle trig. Okay, we're going to look at the trig functions in terms of a triangle. So the triangle we're going to use to do 6, 5 is a right triangle. And what does that mean? Yeah. Uh, right. So a right triangle is just an angle with a 90 degree, a triangle with a 90 degree angle. Now the side across from the 90 has a special name. Can anyone remind me what that is? Yep. Hypotenuse. And then the other two sides have the same name as well. What are the two sides in a right triangle that are not the hypotenuse? Uh, yeah. Those are the legs. So here's a diagram explaining what we just said. So we got a right triangle. The hypotenuse is across from the 90. A lot of times when we pick a variable for it, we use C. And the two legs are the sides that are not the hypotenuse. Doesn't matter which leg is which. But the two legs are usually A and B. And that ties in with the fact that we have two. Now, what do the, all the angles in a triangle have to add up to? <clears throat> they all have to add up to 180. And how much have you used right there? 90. You've already used 90. So then that only leaves 90 left for these other two, which means these other two angles here and here have to be less than 90. If they were more, it wouldn't add up to 180. So the angles that we're going to focus on in the right triangle are the acute angles. So when we start looking at trig, it's going to be from the perspective of one of these acute angles. Which one? Well, it depends on the problem. But they'll, they'll tell you which one. Okay, uh, let's look at this. Pythagorean theorem. What is the Pythagorean theorem? Yeah? Uh, it's a formula used to determine the, the lengths of the two sides. Okay, and can you explain to me what what, what the formula is? Uh, it's a squared plus b squared plus c squared. And what are a and b again? The two lengths. And, and c? c is the right. So, in general, the idea of the Pythagorean theorem is if you square one leg, and you square the other leg, and you add them together, it is equal to the hypotenuse squared. Why? Why does a squared plus b squared equal c squared? Anybody know? That's what the theorem says. Yeah. <laughs> It, it is not. It is not something, it's not like saying parallel lines don't cross. Okay. That's that's called a postulate, and that's not something you can prove. Oh, I forgot about postulate. This is a theorem. So a theorem is something that can be shown that it is true. And we're going to look at why it's true. There are probably a hundred different ways to prove that that theorem is true. This one is, I think it's from a, a book called Proofs Without Words. So it's all proofs of different things, but all they do is like show you a picture. It's not like a paragraph explaining. So it's like a picture, and then they might show a formula next to the picture, which is what we're going to do. Okay, um, so what do we want to do? It's been a year since I've done this. Okay. I want to find the area 
of this shape. Right there. What is that shape? A square. It's a square because all the sides are C and then all the corners are 90. So, yeah, it's a square. But I want to find the area of the red square two different ways. One way is pretty straightforward. I think that's the way most people would think <laughs> to do it right away. So, area of red square. Method one. What's the simplest way to find the area of that red square? Okay, so what what's the base times the height? C squared. C squared. So let's just do the base, length times width, or side times side, however you want to think about it. I'm going to write it as length times width. So length times width. And that gives you c squared. So that's the first thing. How can I find the area a different way? Uh, could you find the total area of the bigger square and subtract the triangle square? Yep. So now, instead of doing length times width, width um, I guess I could use a different color. Let's find, let's do area of the green square. Um, yeah, I'll write it. So area of green square minus the area of each triangle in the corner of that big square. Did so, say the triangle times four? Yeah. <laughs> it's the same yeah. It's the same triangle four times. The short side of the triangle is A, and the long side is B. And that's the same for each triangle. So the area of the green square minus four times the area of the triangle. Okay, so let's do that. So to find the area of the green square, I need the length of one side of it. What's the length of one side of the green square? A plus B. A plus B. And we have to raise that to the second power, because it's A plus B times A plus B, minus four times. Now let's find the area of one of these green triangles. What's the area of a triangle? One half base times height. Okay, so one half. What's the what's the base of the green triangle? B. B. And what's the height? A. a. However you want to look at it. B and A. Or A and B. It does it doesn't matter. Could we rewrite it as two A B? Yep. So we can change this part to two A B. And this part we need to foil out. What's A plus B squared? Two A squared. No, it's all Sorry. It's A squared plus A B plus A plus B A or plus A B. So two A B. So two of the A Bs, yep. And then plus B squared. Plus B squared. Yeah. Okay, so what happens there? It what cancels? Two AD. The plus 2AB and the minus 2AB. So this is the area of the, group of the red square. Right. Method one, we figured out the area of the red square by just doing C times C. And method two, we found the area of the big square and we subtracted four times the area of the triangle. So what do we know about, let's say this is box one and box two. But they're, equal. they're the same. They're the same. 
This is one method of calculating the area of the red square. And this is the second method of calculating the area of the red square. Well, it's the same red square. So then that means method one and method two are equal. So a squared plus b squared is equal to c squared. Wow. That was really interesting. And that's probably one of, there's a hundred different ways to prove that, but that's, that's the one that I really? Oh, yeah. Oh, that was uh, all different kinds of pictures. Wow. Yep. All just different pictures. And there's probably ways to do it that are not as geometry based. But this is a this is more of a geometry based kind of proof. All right. So now we're going to look at um, the six trig functions again: sine, cosine, tangent, cosecant, secant, and cotangent. But this time we're not going to define them using a coordinate on the unit circle. We're going to define them using the words opposite, adjacent, and hypotenuse. So let me give you the definition first, and then I'll explain what opposite and adjacent, um, what those mean. So sine is defined to be opposite, over hypotenuse. And when I say opposite, I mean the length. So all these trig functions are a ratio of two lengths. Length of opposite divided by length of hypotenuse. Now, if you divide two numbers that are lengths, like I don't know, six inches and five inches, what's the unit when you divide six inches by five inches? Inches. Well, the, not the unit on the final answer. This is all inches and squared. Mm, if you multiplied inches times inches, it would be inches squared. Like if you had a rectangle that was 5 by 6. You multiply them like to find the area, that would be inches squared. But what's 6 inches divided by 5 inches? Just the unit. So the inches does cancel out, which means what? You're left with six over You're just left with six over five. There is none. There is none. So when you find a trig function, like say you do sine of uh, I don't know three, that number point one four one one. There is no unit on that number. It is just the number 0. 0.1411. It's the ratio of the length of the opposite side to the hypotenuse side in a triangle. No number. All right, cosine. Um, same idea. It's a ratio of two lengths in the triangle, but it's the length of the adjacent over the hypotenuse. And tangent is the length of the opposite over the adjacent. I'm going to talk about what opposite adjacent and hypotenuse mean in a second. Now, what was the trig function that we would, well actually, before I ask that, we take each one of these three trig functions and we do something to them to get the other three normally. Anyone remember yet? We flip them. Yep, find the reciprocal. So, does anybody remember the name of the trig function that you get when you flip sine? Yep. Cosecant. Yep. So the cosecant is hypotenuse over opposite. What's the name of the trig function you get when you flip cosecant? The reciprocal is secant. And what's the reciprocal of tangent? Cotangent. And the definitions are exactly what we've done before. We flip them. And there's a way that some people use to try to remember the three on the left. And it's that sine is opposite over hypotenuse. Cosine is the adjacent over the hypotenuse. 
and tangent is the opposite over the adjacent. So some people remember that um, using Sakatella. I asked one year how people remembered it, and somebody said Sacagawea. Uh, Sacagawea is not going to help. It's Sakatella. Um, so. And then the other three, well, you really don't have to memorize them because if you know the first three, the other three are just fluffy. Okay, so any questions on those? So those are our six trig functions defined in terms of sides in a triangle. Now, when I say hypotenuse, I think everybody knows what that one is. The hypotenuse is just across from the 90. But opposite and adjacent, I what we call their relative. It's like, like the words left and right. Left and right are relative to the direction you face. So for me, left is the door and right is the window. Now for you, that's the opposite. So the way you figure out opposite and adjacent is you need to know which way you are facing in the triangle. So if this is a triangle, what they'll do is they'll mark one of the acute angles with basically like where you're standing. Let's say you're standing here. Opposite is the side that is across from you. So it's farthest away. So if you were standing here, opposite is the side that is the farthest away. It's the side that basically, if you erased opposite, it has no effect on this angle. This angle is still there. Adjacent is the side that's right next to the angle. And if you think, well, wait, there's two sides next to the angle, well, one of them's the hypotenuse. So it's the side that's next to the angle that's not the hypotenuse. Adjacent is the side that if you got rid of it, you don't have an angle there anymore. You just lost one side. So how about if I drew my triangle like this, and I marked that, as the perspective, if you're standing here, what side would be opposite now? The bottom. It's the side that's farthest away. The opposite side doesn't have anything to do with this angle in terms of like if you erase it, it doesn't affect it. And which side would be adjacent? Yeah, the left side. And that's the hypotenuse. So opposite and adjacent change depending on which angle in the triangle the perspective is, is from. Any uh, questions on that? So if you have two right triangles and the angles are the same, the angles are congruent. It doesn't mean the triangles are congruent. It only means that they are similar. Similar means that a triangle is like an enlargement or a reduction in the geometry. Okay, it's like a dilation. So if all the angles in two triangles are the same, then we know they are similar. So it doesn't because of that, it doesn't matter how big you draw your triangle. The sine of 45 degrees is always going to be the same answer, whether it's in a triangle that has big sides or a triangle that has small sides. It's not about the lengths of the sides. It's about the ratio of the lengths of the sides. And changing the size of the triangle doesn't affect ratios. So let me show you an example. Here's a 30, 60, 90 right triangle that we learned about that when we did unit circle trig. And I've labeled the sides 1, 2, square root 2. And those are correctly labeled for a 30, 60, 90. Let's say I want to find the sine of 30 degrees. So everything is from the perspective of 
that in. What's the definition for some? Not opposite over adjacent. That would be the time. Opposite over hypotenuse. What side is opposite the third? One. One. And what's the hypotenuse? Two. Two. So in this particular triangle, the sine of 30 degrees is one half. Now, I'm going to do a dilation of this triangle. I doubled the lengths of all the sides. So now it's 2, 4, and 2 square roots of 3. Does everyone agree that this triangle is exactly double the size of this one with the labels I put? Okay. But the angles are still the same. It's just they're larger sides. Let's find the sine of 30 in the larger triangle. What side is opposite the 30? 2. two. Over hypotenuse, which is 4. And what does that reduce to? 1 half. So the point is that the sine of 30 is always 1 half. It does not matter how big or small of a triangle you have. It's always going to be 1 half. And that's what I said right here. Any questions on that? So, let's say that I gave you something like this. I'm going to go back to the directions, but this is the kind of problem we're going to look at. I'm going to tell you that the sine is 5, 6. So maybe I'll give you the cosine or the tan. If I tell you that the sine is equal to 5 sixths, what have I basically given you? <clears throat> the, opposite, the length of the opposite side and the length of the hypotenuse. I've given you the length of two sides, the opposite and the hypotenuse. Now, to do the other five trig functions, you're probably going to need the adjacent. How would you get the adjacent from these two? Yep. You would use the Pythagorean theorem. So as long as you've given two out of three of the sides, you can find the third one. Then you know every side, and you can figure out any trig function they want. So this is that same idea. I'm just summarizing it by writing it up. So you're going to take the information that you're given, could be any one of the trig functions, and use that information to label two sides in a triangle and then use the Pythagorean theorem to find the third sign. And once you know the third sign, you can find anything you want. Okay, so you can, if you want to try to summarize that however you want, but that, that's the idea. So you label two sides, use the Pythagorean theorem, and now you can figure out whatever you want. So we'll we'll go through that example. We're going to do the one where it says sine of theta equals five six. Okay, so sine of theta equals 5, 6, find all the other trig functions. <clears throat> Even though we don't need to do sine, I like to just write them all down. Because I'm in the habit of putting 3 on the left and 3 on the right. That's just how I do it. Five over six. We know that. So we can fill that one in. And now let's draw this out and let's figure out the side that we're missing. Doesn't matter where you put theta. What matters is after you place theta, 
that you put the five and the six in the right spot. Theta can never be the ninth. The ninety is its own its own thing. Theta has to be one of the acute angles. So let's put theta there. So what's the height of this triangle going to be? Five. And what about the hypotenuse? Six. And now we'll use Pythagorean theorem to get the bottom side. Wait, okay, sorry, why did you put theta there? Uh, you can put theta as any one of the acute angles. Doesn't matter. Either one? Either one. But if you put it in the other spot, you're going to have to put your five in the other spot. Yeah. But it'll all come out the same. Okay, so we've got that. So set up our Pythagorean theorem. Uh, 36. I'm just going to call the bottom side X. Whatever letter you want to temporarily call it. The letter is not important because it's not going to be part of the final answer. Alright, so what is x going to equal? Square root of 11. Yep. And usually when you're writing out trig functions like this, you leave your answer exact. So let's leave it as square root of 11. Okay, so looking at that diagram, what is uh, the cosine. Square root of 11 over 6. And what's the tangent? Um, 5 over square root of 11, which you'll need to change that mm -hmm. to be uh, 5 square root of 11 over 11. Then. 5 square root of 11 over 11. Okay, how about my cosecant? Six over five. Six over five. Okay, my secant? Six square root of eleven over eleven. Yep, so we gotta flip it, fix it. So six square root of eleven over eleven. And what about my cotangent? Square root of eleven over five. Yeah, square root of eleven over five. We can just flip the one that we originally had for tangent. And those are the six trig functions for theta. At no point in this problem did we actually find theta. We don't know how big theta is in degrees. Any one of these six pieces of information is enough to figure it out, uh, but that wasn't the point of this problem. Any questions on that? Okay. So let's try this one. Let's do the six. Did I finish this? Oh, actually, I didn't do this one. Let's do find the six trig functions of theta. This one was right below the other one. How long is the side I'm missing? Uh, it's longer than both of them. What do you mean? I mean... It's equal to 5 squared plus 12 squared. Isn't it 13? 13. Yeah. Yeah. So it's exactly 13. That's a Pythagorean triple. It's like 3, 4, 5. This is another one. 5, 12, 13. There's an infinite amount of these Pythagorean triples where all the numbers are integers for the sides. Okay, so now we can go through, um, let's just do the first three. The sine, the cosine, and the tangent. Layla, what's the sine here? Five over 13. And we just leave it like that. We generally do not change that to a decimal. Caleb, how about the cosine? Um, Twelve over thirteen. And Aaliyah, the um, the tangent. Five over twelve. 
And if they did ask for the other three, what would you do with those? You just flip them. So the nice thing about a Pythagorean triple is you don't have a square root for one of the sides, so you never have to deal with fixing the square root. But if you end up, like the last problem, with a square root, do not change square root of 11 to a decimal when you're doing something like this. Leave it as square root of 11. Okay. Um, let's try finding the six trig functions of 45 degrees. This time, you have to come up with your own diagram. Can you just go with any length for those sides? Right. Does the length matter? I mean, it has to be appropriately labeled, yeah. but does the size of the triangle matter? No. No. Whether you do a small 45, 45, 90, and the person next to you does a big one, we know the size triangle doesn't make a difference. So it's isosceles. So you just have to pick two sides that are the same and use Pythagorean theorem to get the third. So what could we pick for these two sides? Okay, you could do three. Why not just pick one? Maybe one would be even simpler. Okay, all right. You could have done three and three. And that makes the hypotenuse square root of two. All right, now we can do the six trade functions. Okay, let's start with those. All right, what? Is the and it doesn't matter which angle you use because they're both 45s. So do it from the perspective of this one or do it from the other one. It's going to come up. Um, what would my sign be? Square root of 2 over 2. Yep. And how about my cosine? It's also square root of 2 over 2. Uh, tangent? Yeah. Tangent's going to be 1. How about uh, cotangent? Also 1. Let's do cosecant. Cosecant would be the square root of 2 over 1. It's the hypotenuse over the opposite. Hypotenuse and then opposite. So square root of 2 over 1. And what about the secant? Yeah, because the sine and cosine are the same, so are the secant and the cosecant. Okay. And there's your six trig functions for 45 degrees. Any question on All right, let's see if we can figure out. Uh, I'm just going to do the first three. Because if you can get the first three, you just have to flip. But let's do the first three for sine, sine, cosine, and tangent 30 and 60. And here's my hint. What kind of triangle did I just make there? Equal I made an equilateral. And I purposely made all the sides 2, 2, and 2. And I think, well, why not 1, 1, and 1? Well, let's see what happens. How could I create a 30, 60, 90 triangle in that picture? Draw a line down the middle. Draw a line right down the middle. And using geometry, you could prove that if you draw that line down the middle, you have two sides that are that are congruent, like the one you drew is congruent to itself, and these two sides have a 2 and a 2, and if you draw it straight down, that makes this a 90. So that's called the hypotenuse leg theorem that proves the triangle on the left and on the right congruent to each other, and there's many other ways to prove it. But the point is, you just made two congruent triangles. So we know that this is a 60. And if these two triangles are congruent, and that was a 60, how much more is each one of them? 30. Yeah, they're each 30. So here's 30, 60, and 90. 
And this is why I made each side two. If these triangles are congruent, that is congruent to that. So they must each be equal to one. If you had made all the sides in the big triangle one, it would have been fine. It's just each of these would have been one half. Okay. So now I know the whole thing is two. And this part is one. So now that I know that, what's going to be the height, which is the other side in my 30, 60, 90? Yep, it's going to be square root of 3. Because if you square that, you get 3. And if you square that, you get 1. 3 plus 1 is 4. And the square root of 4 is 2. So again, one where you had to make your own diagram to figure out the trig function. So uh, just with Pythagorean theorem. You generally can only make your own diagram easily if it's a 45-45 or a 30-60. If it was like an 80-10-90, eh, I don't know what you're going to really do with that. So these are the two that we can do pretty easily. All right, let's do the 30 first. Sign. Cosine and tangent. What's my, actually, we did this one already. What's the sine of 30? Yep, that was the example I showed you earlier. So that's one half. Um, what about the cosine of 30? Square root 3 over 2. And the tangent of 30. So tangent is opposite over um, let me think of square root three over four. Opposite over adjacent. So square root three over three. Yeah. And for the sixties, let's see. The difference with sixty is now instead of like you're standing at the thirty, pretend like you're standing at the sixty. So what's the sign of 60? Opposite over hypotenuse, so square root 3 over 2. How about, uh, Logan, what would be the cosine of 60? Adjacent over hypotenuse. And Eric, what about the tangent of 60? Can you say it again? One over square root of three. Uh, let me see. For 60, tangent is opposite over adjacent. So, what side is opposite to 60? Square root of three over one. Which we just put square root three. Any questions on how we did thirties and sixties? Okay. What does it mean? I think we talked about this, but what does it mean if two angles are complementary? Yeah. What was it if they um, if the two angles add up to ninety? They add up to 90, and they have to be what kind of angles? They have to be acute, and acute means greater than zero. So you couldn't have like 100 and negative 10. Now, we're not really thinking about negative angles in this section because triangles don't have negative angles, but the point is two angles that are positive and add up to 90. Well, that's what we talked about on the unit circle. That's just rotation in a different direction. So negative angles are usually used to measure direction on a circle. They're not used in a polygon, like a triangle. So why do the two acute angles in a right triangle have to be complementary? Okay. Because one angle is already 90, so the other two have to add up to the other 90 to get one. Yep. Exactly. That's exactly it. So when we label a triangle, 
we have to label five things down here. There's three sides that you don't know, and there's two angles. One of the angles is always a 90, so it's going to use this symbol. The three sides, we use letters that we use in the Pythagorean theorem, A, B, and C. Now, some books also use A and B again for the angles. The confusing thing about that is what they'll do is use uppercase letters for angles and lowercase letters for sides. The reason I don't like the capital letters for, for one and lowercase letters for the other is depending on the letter you use, some capital and lowercase letters look the same. Yeah, so, C, yeah. so if we, when we get into this not being a 90 degree angle and we need to label it, I don't want to use capital C's and lowercase C's. That gets confusing. And the other thing is, if you ask me, how did you get A, then I have to ask you which A, or big one or little one. So it keeps it clear if we use Greek letters for angles and English alphabet letters for the sides. Um, what is that Greek letter in the lower right? Alpha. And in the top? Beta. So it doesn't matter how you draw your triangle in terms of like which way it's facing. The key that you always want to make sure of is wherever you put A, put alpha across. So you can remember they both start with A. Alpha starts with A, and A starts with A. It is so A across from alpha, and if you put B over here, you put beta over there. So B always goes across from beta, a always goes across from alpha. C is the hypotenuse. Does not matter how you draw your triangle. Just maintain the A across from alpha type thing. So let's let's look at this one. Let's find a couple different things. What's the sign of alpha? It's not going to be numeric, but in that picture, the sign of alpha is A over C. Now I want to do two things to make a new problem. I want to put the word co in front of sine. What do we call that? We call that cosine. And instead of using alpha, I want to use the angle that's complementary to it. Which angle is complementary to alpha? Beta. So I did two things. Put the word co in front of that. And I'm using the complementary angle. What's the cosine of beta? Adjacent over hypotenuse, which is A over C. Came out the same. Let's do another one. Let's do the tangent of alpha. Um, what's the tangent of alpha? A over B. Okay. Now, put the word co in front of that trig function, and what do you get? You get the co tangent. And what angle is complementary to alpha? Beta. So, cotangent, remember that's adjacent over opposite. So pretend you're standing right there. What's the adjacent? A. And what's the opposite? B. B. What do you notice about the tangent of alpha and the cotangent of beta? They're the same. What are these angles called again? They're complementary. And these are called cofunctions. Co is when you co functions is when you put the word co in front of a function. Like secant, cosecant. Yep. So there are three pairs of co functions: sine and cosine, secant, cosecant, tangent, and cotangent. And if you take Co functions, 
and you use angles that are complementary, you always get the same answer. <coughs> Now, the trig functions in the problem are not co-functions, and the angles are not complementary. This doesn't work at all. So this has to be set up very specific uh, to work. So let me give you something you could do. Um, let's say the sine of 30 degrees. I want to figure out what that's the same as. It, it's the same as something else. To figure out what it's the same as, first write down the co-function. What's the co-function? Cosine. Cosine. And now, write down the angle that's complementary. 60. 60. Yep. The sine of 30 and the cosine of 60 are exactly the same thing. And you can keep check it. If you put it in degrees, sine of 30, cosine of 60, same thing. How about, uh, let's say, tangent of 10? What would that be the same as? Cotangent of 80. Yep. So that should help you to do this. Sine of 35 minus the cosine of 55. I have no idea, and I really don't know what the sine of 35 is, and I don't know what the cosine of 55 is. It's not an angle that I have memorized. But I don't need to know what it is to do that problem. It just equals zero. Why does it equal zero? Number. Yeah. Sine and cosine are cofunctions. 35 and 55 are complementary. That means they're equal. So you're just subtracting two things there that are equal, and you get zero. Now, what if it was a plus sign? So if you add two things that are equal, it's always one. What do you get if you add two things that are equal in general? Yeah, you get the thing doubled. Well, we don't we don't know what the thing is, so this idea wouldn't work with addition. It wouldn't help you at all. But subtraction it does work because whenever you subtract two things that are the same, it doesn't matter what they are. It's always equal. <coughs> you couldn't do like wait, so sine. Sine 35 degrees minus cosine 55 degrees isn't equal to 2 sine 35 degrees. Nope, because you're subtracting two things that are the same. Oh no, because that'd be 0 equals 4. Never mind. So it works with subtraction, it doesn't work with addition. Uh, what else would it work for? Division. It would work with division. But you have to check and make sure it's set up right. What are tangent and cotangent? Those are the co-functions. And what do 20 and 70 add up to? 90. Okay, they add up to 90. If this was like 19 and 70, no, it doesn't work. So what are you going to get here? Wait. Wait, just take a zero. They're the same thing. It's got to be one. Right. You're dividing two things that are the same. Again, tangent of 20. That's not 20 degrees. It's not a special angle that I know. Neither is 70. But the point here is you don't need to know it. You're dividing two things that are the same. Now, what if you multiply two things that are the same? So it would be that thing's doubled? Squared. So this trick doesn't help you with multiplication unless you know what the original thing was. But that's not what we'd be using for. So, very, very special application, not something that comes up a lot, but if it does, it's really nice to be able to simplify it this way. Any questions on that? Uh, well, I guess we can answer this one. The two answers you always get are zero and one, but then sometimes they might have a little arithmetic in it. 
The answer here is five. The answer here would be five. Because this comes out to what? One. One, one <coughs> times two plus three. Wow. So something that looks like it could be a pretty complicated kind of thing is actually pretty simple. Any questions on that? So that'll be uh, the homework for tonight. Most of it's in the book. Yeah, 1 through 14, 16 to 20 is just the events. Uh, 21 to 24 is all. And then simplify those two problems using the theorem I just showed. Okay, so we'll, um, we'll go over that tomorrow. And then hopefully we should be able to finish up the second half of the section tomorrow.